So, welcome everyone. A quick note that we are recording and that the recording will be published on our YouTube channel, History at Newcastle. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, wherever you may be located, and to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and in particular to the Pamelong clan of the Wabagal people of the land on which the Callaghan campus resides, and that's where we in the room are located today. Our presenter today, Nicholas Orr, is currently waiting on examiner's reports on his doctoral thesis on contemporary indigenous iconoclasm in global perspective, which he submitted in early February under the auspices of the Center for the Study of Violence at the University of Newcastle. In the interim, he chooses global history at the University of New South Wales. In 2023, his research appeared in the English Historical Review, Patterns of Prejudice, and in the volumes Visual Redress in Africa from Indigenous and New Materialist Perspectives, published by Routledge, and The Palgrave Handbook on Rethinking Colonial Commemorations. The paper he is presenting today, which draws on his uh, thesis, is titled Spectacular Resistance, Indigenous Iconoclasm in the Late 20th Century Settler Colony. Nick, over to you. Thanks, Sasha. Good morning, everyone. So yeah, as Sasha said, uh, just a little over six weeks ago, I submitted my thesis, and that was the culmination of four years research into contemporary anti-colonial iconoclasm from a global perspective. It focuses on indigenous people's contestation of colonial monuments in the United States, Latin America, Australia, and New Zealand. So today I'd like to start my talk with how I became interested in this topic. It was 2008, and I was living in Madrid when the last equestrian statue of Francisco Franco fell. It was removed from a public square in Santander to the north. Rather than leave it where it was, vulnerable to protest or susceptible to creative intervention, the authorities chose to put the statue into storage. For me, a recent graduate of fine arts and a practicing sculptor, this was a missed opportunity. As much as artists are creators, there's a long tradition of critical and sometimes destructive art practices directed at monuments. From Gustave Courbet, who led the toppling of the Vendome Column in 1871, to more recent examples like Christina Lucas, who attacked with a sledgehammer this reproduction of Moses by Michelangelo. Many of those that study artists art historians among them, also have an abiding interest in not, on, not only in arts production, but its destruction. This is seen by some as a contradiction, that art history study of iconoclasm is a betrayal of the esteem in which the discipline holds the art object. Yet I subscribe to the view of Horst Breederkamp when he says that iconoclasts are the real iconophiles, it is they more than others who believe in the social, the religious, the psychological power of images. So by looking at the destructive passions elicited by a work of art, we can more clearly detect its hidden powers. The disappointment I felt at the hiding away of the all too powerful Franco statue from the public on the streets of Santander stayed with me. So that when grassroots activists challenged Confederate symbols in 2013, first it was the flags, and then toppled the statue of Cecil Rhodes in Cape Town in 2015, I wondered at what might have happened had the state left the Franco statue within reach of its detractors. My question was soon answered when a headless statue of the dictator was wheeled out of storage for an exhibition in Barcelona. A variety of responses followed. Treatments included an inflatable doll, gay pride graffiti, symbols of Catalonian independence, a pig's head, a barrage of eggs, and the statues outright toppling. Cases continued to appear when I relocated to Australia in April of 2017. I was welcomed just three months after arriving by graffiti on the Captain Cook statue in Hyde Park in Sydney. 
Pink paint was thrown over another in St Kilda a year later. So when I approached Philip Dwyer at the end of 2019, proposing to develop a thesis on iconoclasm within the Center for the Study of Violence, I already had a modest case list and a vague conviction that we were witnessing a surge of image breaking in anti-racist iconoclasm. Luck would have it that Philip had been exploring the links between iconoclasm and violence, preparing around that time a talk at Trinity College Dublin entitled Broken Stones, Broken Bones. By this time, I was under the impression that iconoclasm was following me wherever I went. You know, some people bring the sunshine, the rain, <laughs> I bring the statue destruction, it seems. When summer hit the Northern Hemisphere in 2020, I was absolutely convinced of this. That's when protests and takedowns multiplied after the killing of George Floyd. The pace of monument iconoclasm has hardly let up since then, as you'll know. It's followed me through the four years of my PhD and quite incredibly seems to have reached a climax. Well, we don't know that yet in Australia very recently. The speed at which new cases have emerged has been matched by scholars' production on these phenomena. My co-supervisor, Nancy Cushing, Philip and I are all guilty of having added to the literature, creating something of a microcosm of iconoclasm studies in our own backyard. The overriding impression in the literature on recent anti-racist iconoclasm directed at symbols of slavery and colonialism is that it's the first time a purge of symbols initiated from below has reached a global scale. A whole different category of global iconoclasm arguably occurred during the Second World War, which literary scholar James Noyce termed industrial or total iconoclasm in reference to the mass destruction of cultural heritage under Allied bombings. It's indisputable that since the mid 2010s, we have witnessed through mainstream and social media an implacable wave of defacement, destruction and removal of monuments to colonizers and enslavers. These are the so-called statue wars fed by the Black Lives Matter and Roads Must Fall movements and their spin-offs. The repetition of slogans and reinterpretation of local struggles has provided evidence of solidarity networks that span continents and oceans. A relatively simple analysis of social media or photographic records yields proof of influence between the various sites. Granted the importance that scholars of iconoclasm give to questions of scale and destructive intensity, these statue wars are remarkable. Yet the apparent novelty of the statue wars scale has distracted scholars from a fundamental question. Is this truly the first case of global anti-iconoclasm? Or have symbols of racial oppression been contested on this scale previously? It's relatively easy to produce evidence for the global flow of iconoclastic practice through internet and social media sources. But how might we do this prior to these communications technologies? Must we wait till the age of social media for the appearance of global iconoclasm? My scepticism towards these claims of novelty is rooted in an understanding of iconoclasm as a form of resistance. I'm of course talking about iconoclasm practiced from below. When practiced by states or elite groups, iconoclasm is more likely to be oppressive and not liberatory. Iconoclasm can be viewed alongside a vast repertoire of resistance, including armed conflict, industrial and political action in the form of sabotage, strikes, petitions, and right down to the almost imperceptible actions and subtle everyday activities. The study of resistance in all its diverse forms has been famously limited by the methods used for its detection. Homi K. Baba coined the term sly civility and James C. Scott, the hidden transcript to get at the harder to discern forms of disobedience 
of colonized and other subaltern subjects. Baba incidentally also coined the term spectacular resistance, something I learned only after titling today's talk. Where his concept identifies surreptitious rebellion, the spectacular resistance I refer to is loud and hard to miss, although has often been discounted as ineffectual and therefore ignored by historians. <clears throat> A purported lack of resistance has sometimes anchored exceptionalist claims that iconoclasm in Australia has been tepid at best. With my deepest respects to the historian Bruce, Bruce Buchan, I too held this opinion on screen before undertaking my research. We should remember that until settler histories of Australia recognised the existence of sustained frontier warfare, they glossed over Indigenous resistance to British colonisation. I argue that we've made the same mistake in the terrain of iconoclasm and in doing so, have missed a history of Indigenous iconoclasm of colonial monuments, not only in Australia, but throughout the settler colonial world. My thesis posits that global Indigenous resistance favoured iconoclastic strategies through the late 20th century, but that standard historical approaches are ill-equipped or ill-disposed to recognise this. Despite the spectacular nature of anti-colonial iconoclasm, it has receded into the background of scholarship or has disappeared entirely. The literature on iconoclasm has very little to say regarding indigenous resistance and more surprisingly about anti-colonial resistance generally. For me, it's striking that the field has paid very little attention to iconoclasm's role in anti-colonial struggle. Equally baffling is that it's shown only marginally more interest in the oppressive function of iconoclasm in the hands of colonizers, but that is outside my remit. It's all the more striking given the geographical and chronological expansion of the field since the 1970s and increasingly since the 2010s. Long gone are the days in which iconoclasm was seen as a fitting category of analysis only for Byzantine conflicts of religious icons. Work by David Friedberg in the 1970s opened the concept up to the activities of Dutch reformers. Also, his German contemporaries, Martin Warnke and Horst Breederkamp, expanded it well beyond religious conflicts. There's scarcely a revolution that hasn't been analysed by scholars for its iconoclastic events, including some work on anti-colonial struggles of emerging African and Asian nations after the Second World War. By the early 1990s, there was a general understanding that iconoclasm was to be found to a greater or lesser degree in every revolutionary period of history and throughout the radical movements of the modern day. But still, hardly a word has been written on Indigenous iconoclasts outside local cultural and religious practices. Colleagues in global history and new imperial history, such as Antoinette Burton, Priyambada Gopal, Priya Satya, and David Vivas, just to mention a few, have arrived at similar conclusions regarding resistance generally. They've shown it to be ubiquitous to histories of empire. Centuries of opposition to empire unleashed in, in a range of contexts has inevitably produced an impressive range of strategies. But to my frustration or delight, because this is where the gap is, their analysis does not extend to iconoclasm. Big histories such as these do better at covering military, economic and political events deemed influential or world-changing enough to warrant attention. Iconoclasm, however, is typically treated as a cultural epiphenomenon, a merely symbolic act lacking any significant historical agency. It gets left out or mentioned only as anecdote. 
left to art historians, the, icon the iconophiles, to probe the potential of symbol contestation to change the world. These two fields have lacunae that are mutually reinforced. Iconoclasm studies has ignored anti-colonial motives, while anti-colonial histories have prioritized other forms of resistance over the contestation of colonial symbols. This explains why academic sources have reinforced the myth of global iconoclasm occurring for the first time in the mid 2010s. There are no counter narratives and only a piecemeal source base to draw upon. The emerging literature overwhelmingly casts the scale of the statue wars as unprecedented. And the research to come out of histories of iconoclasm and resistance provide very little evidentiary basis to counter this. Although neither field has focused on anti-colonial iconoclasm, their insistence on the universality of anti-colonial resistance on the one hand and revolutionary iconoclasm on the other gave me reason to believe I might find precedence to the current statue wars. Anti-colonial iconoclasm by indigenous peoples hardly received a mention was to me counterintuitive and an exceedingly good place to start my investigations. So as I've mentioned, the state of the literature was in constant growth as I was conducting my research, but my original observations made some three years ago still stand. While researchers have engaged increasingly with the contestation of colonial and other symbols, some even doing so with reference to the idea of iconoclasm, these efforts have been geographically fragmented and largely limited to the events associated with the movements Black Lives Matter and Roads Must Fall. There is a broad consensus on statue activism being a long-standing practice, but very little work into the transnational linkages that could help establish the first global iconoclasm at an earlier point in time. This is the space in which I conducted my research. So given it won't be possible to cover the full depth of my thesis today, I've chosen to present a few key moments in my journey, those eureka moments that confirmed the direction of my thesis or otherwise forced me to qualify or abandon my arguments. Naturally, I started close to home Despite politicians likening the vandalism of Captain Cook to Stalinist practice or criticizing activists for their slavish imitation of US events, the historical record points to the possibility of a local iconoclastic tradition centered on the Hyde Park statue of Cook and dating back to at least 1971. The activist and academic Gary Foley, a Goombayanga man, has widely publicized his and his colleagues' actions against this monument on screen. The first such, such communique came days after this intervention. Foley, Paul Coe, Dennis Walker, and a fourth person appeared in the Sunday Australian, announcing the existence of the Black Panther Party of Australia. They espoused black power and claimed responsibility for painting that slogan you can see, stating black land rights now. They also feigned plans to blast with dynamite some even more significant targets. Other newspaper sources and ASIO records indicate that several other sites were graffitied, including an historical tower in La Perouse, not far from Cook's landing site in Botany Bay. Although Foley has promoted the idea that they repeatedly targeted the statue, the sources I've had access to don't corroborate this. A source familiar with Foley's communication style also intimated to me that Foley's claims are likely exaggerated for dramatic effect. There were nevertheless other actions in the same period with no clear connection to the Panthers, including the bombing of statues of Sir Henry Parks, Charles Dickens, and allegorical figures in Centennial Park, Sydney, 
the painting of a swastika in monuments to Cook in Cornell in 1968 indicates that the practice may go back further. And in 1970, an ASIO informant alleged that Foley and others plotted to explode a replica of the Endeavour that was touring the nation's harbours for the bicentenary of Cook's arrival. The palpable interest of the media and intelligence agencies in acts of destruction and in the photogenic radicals that practiced them is a good indicator of the modus operandi of political iconoclasts. Their actions are designed to attract attention, to be publicized, to be reproduced through text and image, and to circulate as widely as possible. Resistance takes on a spectacular and theatrical or performative quality, something quite widely recognized in existing work on the American and Australian Panthers and in protest generally of the same period. This opens up several key sites for the research of contemporary iconoclasm, newspaper and television ar archives, intelligence records, the newsletters and serials published by the groups responsible or their allies, footage by independent filmmakers, and the memoirs and oral histories of participants. A survey of these sources revealed an intermittent, though sustained engagement with monuments in Aboriginal protest through the last decades of the 20th century. Very few cases I located occurred before the early 1970s and none that could be attributed beyond reasonable doubt to Indigenous resistance. Here are a few examples. Sam Watson, uh, a member of the Black Panthers in 1972, scaling a statue of King George V outside Old Parliament House. That was at the same time uh, the Tent Embassy was established. Some years on, that's Cook's Cottage in the middle, a land rights protest occupying that site and preventing entry to the cottage. On the right, very small in the background, you can just make out an Aboriginal flag and a group of protesters who chanted and interrupted Prince Wales and a figure of government as they walked towards the unveiling of a statue of James Sterling, uh, a colonial figure in Perth. <clears throat> then moving on to We War, where Eddie Marbo was uh, killed, likely killed in his police cell by uh, police malpractice in 1981. That was followed by uh, graffiti across a whole range of sites in We War, including what you see there, the clock tower, the War Memorial clock tower. In Musgrave Park, 1982, there were the Commonwealth Games in Brisbane. Protests occupied Musgrave Park, the site of a sacred aura ground, and repainted the sign of colonial authority and painted on it Aboriginal land. Then you have, uh, in the lead up to the bicentenary in 1988, um, uh, interventions on the heritage facade of this bicentennial authority office. And the last example in the bottom right is again in Old Parliament House, this time inside, and a shrouding in the Aboriginal flag of a statue of King George V. The most significant uh, feature of this period, I argue, is this shift towards what I've called speculative iconoclasm, or the targeting not of the monuments themselves, but of proxies in the form of repro visual reproductions. By the 2000s, artists and filmmakers had become the leading iconoclasts and produced some of the most spectacular forms of anti-colonial resistance in Australia. The broader counter-cultural counter climate of the 1970s appeared to me to be the most likely source of iconoclastic influence on radicals' decision to attack monuments. But what were the origins more specifically? Did the idea arrive, for example, in the literature brought over by African-American soldiers on rest and recuperation from the Vietnam War? We know they fraternized with their Aboriginal peers in Redfern. 
Was it through coverage of the decolonial wars being fought in Mozambique and Angola? Or was it through Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, a book that we know from published reading lists and memoirs was studied closely by Black Panthers in Australia and the US, by American Indians, and by the largely white New Left. The two passages on screen jump out in particular. They show how Fanon conceived of statues as agents of colonial violence and legitimate targets of anti-colonial resistance. The Australian Panthers emulation of the original Black Panther Party, their dress, their iconography, their phraseology and their policies did not account for their interest in monuments. Accused in 1969 of plotting to destroy the Statue of Liberty, the original Panthers recorded for posterity their absolute aversion to statue iconoclasm. They counted that, quote, every Black Panther Party chapter and leadership knows that we would not waste dynamite on the blowing up of some jive statue, simply because even if a statue was blown up, that would not put any food into our people's stomachs, end quote. The Oakland Panthers' particular brand of spectacular resistance hinged, rather, on the conspicuous bearing of arms. The civil rights and black power movements did exceedingly well at capturing media attention without recourse to monument iconoclasm. I should also add that the size of the African-American population provided a, a level of influence that favoured media coverage and political response. The proportionally smaller populations of Indigenous peoples in, in many settler colonies required a different tool bag. Certainly, Black Panther supporters exploited the photo opportunities that protest on top of or in front of monuments afforded, but party leadership did not encourage such activities and US black power as a whole produced very few instances of monument iconoclasm. The example on the left was produced in Paris and uh, the example on the right is a rare example of speculative iconoclasm in the black power sphere. The reasons for this reside in the geography of black radicalism focused in the North and the concentration of monuments oppressive to African-Americans in the former Confederate South. Had statues to enslavers populated Oakland and other cities in which the Panthers operated, it is possible that their attitudes towards iconoclasm would have been different. Even on the few occasions that the race rebellions of the mid to late 60s affected cities with Confederate monuments, the incidents of property damage and violence occurring uh, occurred overwhelmingly in black neighborhoods at a distance from Confederate statues or monuments, as you can see in this map of Baltimore. Aboriginal radicals in their reinterpretation of black power therefore departed from their peers in the US by embracing the contestation of monuments. Apart from adding weight to the argument that Australian activists do not slavishly follow, but adopt and adapt US examples, this disposition towards statue defacement underscores a fundamental difference between indigenous and other groups relationships with monuments. For indigenous and other oppressed groups, <clears throat> sorry, um, for indigenous peoples, colonial monuments not only oppress, but dispossess, as Tony Birch, Bronwyn Carlson, and others have argued. Recall that the slogan on the Cook statue in Hyde Park was painted with the phrase, uh, land rights now, land back. The location of monuments on unceded land is an affront in itself, and the proximity of such monuments to radical groups creates opportunities for iconoclasm to take place. 
The association between the Australian Panthers and the defacement of monuments begs the question as to where the practice originated and why at this point in time. In my research, inevitably a partial story, uh, local traditions were not forthcoming. Unlike in the case of Maori activism, which I won't have time to touch on today, I'm unaware of any earlier iconoclastic event in the history of Aboriginal resistance to colonisation. Until the last third of the 20th century, resistance here assumed other forms. Though the 1971 cases were unique locally speaking, they were connected to events elsewhere. The 1970s saw growing unrest in Indigenous communities in Anglo-dominated settler societies. The formal process of decolonization brokered by the United Nations after the Second World War measured out the path to self-determination of European possessions in Asia and Africa. Liberation struggles in many emerging nations sped up the road to independence, but these developments were the stuff of the third world. When the resolutions that underpinned decolonization were drawn up in 1960, through careful and deliberate design, indigenous peoples contained within settler colonies were excluded, denied sovereignty of their own lands. Frustrated at the failure of representations, petitions and other procedural means to improve their rights, a younger generation of indigenous activists took to spectacular modes of protest to attract national and international attention to their causes. The search for such methods the search for what such methods might entail is what set Aboriginal activists, Bruce McGuinness, Patsy Kruger, Bob Mazza, Sol Belair, and Jack Davis on their trip to the Congress of African Peoples in Atlanta in 1970. It's not entirely clear who they interacted with at the Congress, but they did have occasion to view documentary footage of the Angolan liberation struggle they saw performances by black theatre groups and they rubbed shoulders with movements beyond black power, including figures of the Mexican American or Chicano movement. Most significantly, the trip coincided with the ongoing occupation of Alcatraz by American Indians, an action which did much to place Native American struggles in the national spotlight, thanks to media coverage and Hollywood support. The Alcatraz takeover produced images and protest methods with a wide circulation. It's likely the delegates encountered these on their tour across several states after the Atlanta conference. Among their destinations was the Shinnecock Reservation on Long Island in New York. In his report on the American tour, Jack Davis, one of the participants wrote, quote, how can black power effectively operate in Australia? One medium which I believe can be adopted is to attack pseudo-Australian pride. Another method which I feel will be adopted is the desecration of sacred places of worship of the white Australian, the statues, the monuments, the places of learning. Davis envisioned the use of red paint, so as to signify the blood of murdered Aboriginal tribes. And he wrote this shortly before the events I've described in Sydney in 1971. Clearly, the black power Davis referred to was a hybrid creature, one that shed the Panthers' disdain for symbolic attacks on jive statues for an iconoclastic adaptation appropriate to the contemporary Australian colonial environment. One might assume that Davis had in mind Alcatraz or the recent defacement of Plymouth Rock. That's on the left in November 1970 and the hanging monument in Mankato, Minnesota by Red supporters. That's second from the right. The ideas expressed by Davis filtered through the activist community, finding echo in Bobby Sykes who wrote just two months before the Panthers hit the Hyde Park statue that radicals among our people will make themselves known through methods similar to those of Alcatraz. 
These plans included uh, the unrealized plot to occupy Pinchgut Island in Sydney Harbour, an unmistakable homage to red power tactics. The occupation and defacement of the Alcatraz monument was just the start of Native American campaigns against Anglo-American symbols. Between 1970 and 72, the tactic extended through the US to Mount Rushmore, Plymouth Rock, a replica of the Pilgrim's Boat, the Mayflower, a statue of Theodore Roosevelt and the General Custer Battlefield Monument. This wave, together with its shorter-lived offshoot in Australia, demonstrates the spread of anti-colonial iconoclasm four and a half decades before the social media fueled statue wars. A quick listing of events on the settler colonial calendar illustrates one of several reasons anti-colonial protest was increasing in this period. Indigenous radicals of the late 20th century understood that the potential for media coverage of monument iconoclasm peaks at moments in which the public's attention is trained on the figures or events represented. Settler colonial societies are pregnant with anniversaries commemorating their origins. Occasions which, because of the national interest they attract, are auspicious for anti-colonial protest. Monuments are reactivated during such rituals. Popular indifference to their existence for a time suspended. This most vulnerable moment in the colony's calendar is often when anti-colonial iconoclasts choose to strike. The late 60s and 70s witnessed the bicentenary of Cook's landings in New Zealand and Australia, the bicentenary of the American Revolution, while through the late 80s and the 90s, Australia and the US celebrated several anniversaries. The most significant of these for the study of global iconoclasm was by far, have I got it there? Oh, good. The quincentenary of the Spanish arrival in the Americas. The target of American Indian iconoclasm shifted at this time from the Anglo-American symbols to those associated with Spanish empire. <clears throat> In 1989, Russell Means, a prominent member of the American Indian Movement, or AIM, and a leading iconoclast of the 1970s, doused a Columbus sculpture with fake blood. His role as the warrior Chingachgook in the film The Last of the Mohicans lent greater visibility to the action. AIM's interest in monuments to Spanish conquest echoed growing opposition to the approaching anniversary throughout the Americas and the Caribbean. The declaration of Quito, uh, drawn up between indigenous groups from North and South America, called for a unified Indian response to the 1992 Jubilee celebrations. The declaration mentions acts of repudiation as one of those responses. <clears throat> Haiti and Mexico both experienced events in anticipation of the anniversary in 1992 itself. Statues of Columbus and various conquistadors were toppled or damaged in Mexico, but also in Bolivia, Honduras and El Salvador. Not only that, but by the mid 90s, Aboriginal activists resumed direct action on colonial monuments in Australia, as did Māori activists in Aotearoa. The geographic spread of this 1990s wave far exceeded that of the 1970s. As an aside, these events coincided with the, the mass destruction and takedowns of Soviet monuments across Central Europe as the USSR dissolved. The spectacular tactics of iconoclasm assumed importance in the context of Indigenous activism in the last three decades of the 20th century. Breaking colonial symbols was a means of attracting the attention of the media, the political class and the general public to the cause of First Nations. It was a tactic frequently aimed at attracting international audiences, 
the nation states in which first peoples were forced to live having ignored their calls for self-determination. Among those audiences were other first peoples resisting similar conditions in settler colonies elsewhere in the world. They adapted their, the practice to their own struggles. The supremely visual nature of iconoclasm and its propagation via photography over vast distances and through print and television networks thus activated global waves of anti-colonial iconoclasm long before social media, internet, or even home computers had become staple commodities. These were not hidden acts of resistance, but dramatic gestures that clamored to be seen. How poignant that such recent history has been obscured so quickly, forgotten in activist circles and by the general public, ignored by scholars and politicians. Absolutely fascinating paper. I uh, open the floor to questions. Thanks so much, Nick. That was great. I have lots of questions, lots of things to say, but I will only say one. I'll ask one question only. Um, as you, it's so interesting, and there's a lot of crossover with the period that I'm looking at in Vietnam and a couple of. Anyway, I won't go into that. But um, I was thinking as you were talking about um, so a few years ago when I was at the University of Melbourne, there was one building which was called the Richard Berry Building. Richard Berry being a eugenicist and. Indigenous students rallied so that the building's name could be changed and the building's name was eventually changed to, I think, the current vice-chancellor or the past vice-chancellor, which is another story. Um, <laughs> anyway, I was thinking, so this, you know, a building is the figurehead of a person, not an actual statue, but the building is, you know, named after this particular figure. And I wonder whether in your research you've looked at that, that because it's not just at the University of Melbourne, that's happened at many different universities whether that's connected or... Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you could come today, Effie. I thought of good research mm. at many points in there and made a few little <laughs> doffs of hat in there um, to that. Um, look, I, the, I, I researched monuments as targets and I didn't isolate only statues. Uh, at the outset, I didn't know how many cases I was going to find and... So I had kind of elastic boundaries in terms of how I was defining monuments. Uh, in the end, I found, you know, a, a reasonable amount of, of cases. Um, but I did want to still include objects that were not statues or perhaps even conventionally thought of as monuments. But I have conceived of them as monuments you know, because of the way that they they occupy space in very similar ways to statues do. And, you know, they assert colonial presence and, mm -hmm. and, and they were treated in identical ways by the iconoclasts. Um, well, not identical, you know, um, very unlikely to splash a building with red paint signifying blood, although it has been done. Yeah. It's, it's much, um, you know, a much closer association with a, a figurative sculpture. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. I think it's a really interesting topic that you've opened up here and very timely. But I'm thinking about method and I'm thinking about how you measure these occurrences because you need something more than the act. You need the act to have been recorded. So it's, your argument's perfectly credible, the rise of um, a, a more open media is going to register and it's going to be something you can measure across the globe. Mm. But are these acts happening earlier and not leaving a historical memory for us to see? I and mean, if, if an act of this type happened in Russia today, I don't know how well we'd have that recorded in the future. So if you're interested in measuring waves of it, that selection bias becomes a question. And is it, um, to elaborate one step further, if you have slum clearance like they had in Melbourne of places where Aboriginal communities were based, 
and they then build a, a tower block to house communities. And you get graffiti on those buildings. Is that an iconoclastic act? Would that get recorded? Okay, yeah, so obviously there'll be cases that I haven't discovered. Yeah, that, that's, that's without saying. Uh, my argument is pinned on the fact that there are sufficient cases and additional evidence to show linkages between these groups. Mm -hmm. and, and so from there, you know, counter this claim that the first global wave occurred in the 2010s. Uh, I have avoided quantitative kind of, you know, measurements of, of, of whatever was going on. And part of the reason I did that was because I think it would just fall on its face. But another is that you can't compare a case one to one. We're talking about images here and uh, witnessing an iconoclastic act in person is, is not really the ultimate aim for these iconoclasts. It's the reproduction through, through you know, reproductive means, photography and dissemination through the media, which multiplies that act. So one act could have a vastly greater impact than another. And so it's not, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship there. And so I just felt that a, a quantitative analysis there would be almost meaningless. Although I do agree, it would be interesting and I, 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 I'm yet to produce some graphs in that sense. Um, yeah, it would, it would be an interesting experiment. Um, I, I encountered that, uh, for example, in, in New Zealand, which I hadn't, haven't spoken about today, that uh, media points in time uh, actively suppressed these cases. And so, you know, where, where police or the public alerted police before media got hold, you know, it was it was hush hush. And, you know, for example, the, the case of the Queen Victoria statue coming down in Geelong just a few days ago, uh, that did not register on my networks. Um, Nancy tipped me off mm -hmm. to that. And, um, you know, it's quite curious where that has been picked up geographically, you know, potentially more interest in the UK than locally and so on. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's something to be said for, for censorship uh, and, and, you know, the impact it might've happened on, had on case numbers. Uh, you know, also there's, there's a, a paradox um, in, in the method that I've pursued in that these are, you know, these are spectacular acts but, but, but don't feature in, in, in the histories. Uh, and, and I found that fascinating. Um, you know, and iconoclasm is, is very broad in terms of treatment. Uh, you know, there are forms of iconoclasm that are surreptitious. Uh, you know, there's a, a case in Charleston in South Carolina of gradual erosion via you know, scratching you know, of children, of women, and so on, of a, a figure of James Calhoun, a, a Confederate figure, a, a slave enslaver. And, you know, over a period of, of months, years, you know, this just kind of wasted away at, to the point that it needed to be raised higher so that people couldn't access it and so on. Uh, so, you know, um, I, I can only say that I've identified sufficient to, to challenge, um, you know, these, these claims of novelty that I set out to do. But um, it's very exciting to think that there are vastly more case numbers out there. Yeah. I have a question if, if, if there's an opportunity. Thanks so much, Nick. It, it's really satisfying at the end of all of this to hear you being able to put it together so coherently and eloquently and, and so on. And, and um, yeah, I look forward to you talking about this a lot more in the future. Um, as you know, we, we became involved in a, a side research project and uh, that involved some artists um, reworking the statue um, virtually. 
and and as you'll recall, one of them raised concerns that they felt that iconoclasm was sort of owned by decolonizing by by Indigenous people here in Australia, and that for us to be involved with this without Indigenous involvement wasn't right, wasn't appropriate. And as you know, I came at this from an environmental perspective, looking at the coal monument and, and um, thinking that um, while it, of course, has significance for Indigenous people, that it was a, also a broader issue of, of um, the environment. And I guess iconoclasm goes back to religious aims, contention between religions and nation states and regimes within states. Um, I'm thinking of no war on the opera house. So do you think that, that now um, decolonization owns statue of iconoclasm? Uh, owns it. Wow. No, I don't think so. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, in the in the last twenty five years, you know, we've had the uh, Bamiyan Buddhas, we've had you know the Taliban involved, you know, very actively uh, in that. Very recently, we've seen in uh, the West Bank um, footage of Israeli bulldozers bulldozing, uh, you know, a, a statue. Um, um, yeah, a Palestinian freedom fighter statue. So I don't think any group will ever own the, the methods. Uh, you know, if, there's, if there's one thing that iconoclasm scholars have agreed on, it's really that these are ubiquitous. And, uh, and, and that was an important discovery because there was a time that, uh, you know, very, very senior people in the field were saying that actually the West has overcome this compulsion to destroy, you know, we've reached this kind of, you know, rational plane in which, you know, we can apprehend images without passions and that, that iconoclasm was the stuff of, of, of the third world of, of, you know, underdeveloped peoples and so on. And um, that, that's been challenged to no end in, in the past few decades. Yeah. Thank you. I was really taken with um, what you said about censorship. Because it seems to me, if I go back to the beginning of your paper, where you begin with that level, lovely quote about how iconoclasts are the only people, yeah, the people who really believe in the power of icons, right? Mm -hmm. It seems that people, you know, the authorities that censor iconoclasm are the people who really believe in the power of iconoclasm. They have to keep it hidden mm -hmm. to try and, mm -hmm. um, which I think is really interesting. and. Your sources speak so beautifully to the way in which, if we can find historical examples of iconoclasm, they're such interesting sources because you've got the double layer, at least two layers. You've got the original meaning of the object and then the, uh, the, the reinterpretation. And you see that a lot in sort of medieval you know, writing, historians writing as, you know, on you know, medieval iconoclasm or the iconoclasm of the, um, of, the, of the Protestant Reformation. It seems to me, though, that when you look at historians writing on those, whether they are people who, at the end of the day, sympathise with the iconoclasts or whether they sympathise with the constructors of the original icons, there's always a little element of regret at the destruction of the, his of the original historical source that goes along with that. Should we as historians feel nervous about iconoclasm or should we be embracing us as, you know, for, as, you know, as, 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 a, as, as a trace of history? I, I come at this as an art historian and there's a chapter in the thesis that charts the, the, the birth of the public statue. And, you know, it, it, it really occurs <clears throat> In, in on a large scale in the 19th century. And, you know, this is a moment in which statues are perceived as by, by historians, by artists, by the whole circle surrounding them as historical documents. Mm -hmm. And even a document of documents, you know, the ultimate document, which is, which is very hard to fathom um, nowadays. Uh, I find that quite, quite difficult 
to understand how 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 that occurred. Um, but yeah, I you know that that is not the case now. You know we hear we hear these arguments, but um, you know I think the the weight of of research shows that they're very contingent objects mm. and. Uh, you know, we're not going to lose history through the loss of an object. That, I mean, that's that's one of my approaches to the question. Another is that I do feel sorry for monuments and monument sculptors within art history, contemporary art history, that they've really been lambasted as, you know, poor art mm -hmm. and and that, you know, other artistic practices have have taken over. Uh, I'm not calling for you know a return to statues. I think that would be anachronistic. But I think as as a phenomenon, as a sign of the times, and you know a document of what was going on, they're very interesting. But you know not not a representation of that. You know the first layer of meaning. Of, uh, you know the, the the history that they're purported to to represent or to signify, but. The, the moment of their production, I think that's where their value lies. So mm -hmm. yes, I, I do agree, but the heritage landscape is a complex, vast one to manage, and we can't preserve everything. Sure. And so um, we, we need to be clear about our priorities of what we do preserve. And just the last thing I'll say on that is that the, 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 these things documents okay so we're not allowed to walk into the archives and record our <laughs> thoughts on on these historical documents but statues and so on function in quite a different way a, a very public facing billboard and you know the, the recording of of sentiments and things on these objects is a further layering of history and um, I think you know as uh, Lisa um, the um, Sydney yeah. Lisa Murray, City of Sydney historian, argued in you know several years ago, uh, you know, and several heritage people in in Latin America have been doing so as well. That you know we should be actually preserving the graffiti and the destroyed the destroyed object as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I just ask? Um, well, it's not really a question; it's more of an observation that when um, the European imperial rivals were exploring the world. The first thing they did when they got to a place that they hadn't been before was to put up a monument. There was a book which looks at all the different monuments that were put up by the Portuguese, the Spanish, right through to Cook with uh, Possession, uh, Possession Island. Um, and the sort of elaborate length that some of them went to uh, to create a physical object which would prove that they were there first because that then gave them an argument when discussing who's <laughs> with, with their rivals. It wasn't to do with the people who live there. And sometimes it might have been on something which, which could be uninhabited, but it was a natural reaction to leave something behind which showed that they had been there. And this was to different degrees, more or less permanent monuments, which I don't suppose lasted hundreds of years since it was done. But if it, it sort of precedes the actual colonization, which may not have been from the same, you know, same European country which put people on up, but it was a, it was something that they did sufficiently often that it's been recorded in at least one history book, which I can't remember the author, but I do have it. Yeah, it's a fascinating area and one that I'd like to pursue in my postdoc. So far, I've been unsuccessful pitching the idea, um, partly because I'm not uh, an early modernist. Um, but uh, I think, you know, equally as interesting in the fact that those were erected, you know, um, the, the case I didn't talk about, the, the Maori activist case, uh, very early on targeted those very monuments, the flagstaffs, mm. especially. Um, and I, that, for me, is the interesting part, the reception of those monuments, you know, from first contact. 
uh, I have no reason to believe why they wouldn't have been iconoclastic. And there are some examples for the, the, the Kirka herders in current day South Africa. Um, when the Portuguese arrived, they erected a, a large padrão, uh, a monumental cross, likely in timber. Um, and it was, it lasted <laughs> not very long. Uh, it was torn down, uh, possibly burnt. And, uh, you know, there, there are bound to be um, cases of that everywhere, I think. Yeah. Oh, no, I just had something that I wanted to say. It wasn't really a question. Is that okay? Yeah. We're running out of time. That's why I didn't. Um, I wonder, it would be so interesting to interview Indigenous figures now, like people from Warriors of the Aboriginal Resistance, something like that. I was thinking also of the Christian Thompson artwork, Othering the Explorer, James Cook, where he holds up, a, you know, the Indigenous artist while he was doing his PhD at Oxford. Holds I up almost put it up today, Yeah, yeah, it's such a great image. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that would be such a good approach to interview and see what they're thinking now. Um, that's yeah, that would be really fascinating. And, and oral history is only something that I, you know, dabbled on through, you know, secondhand sources, didn't conduct it myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, um, please join me in thanking Nick again for both a fascinating, for a fascinating paper and congratulating him for completing his uh, Just before you go, a quick note that, note that we have a break next week due to the Easter long weekend, but that we will return on Friday the 5th of April at our usual time of 10 a.m. in uh, W202 and online. And our speaker will be Michael Robinson from the University of Birmingham who will present on War, Trauma, and the Great Depression, the Treatment and Experiences of First World War Veterans, 1929 to 1939. And we hope to see you there.